Hey, this is John Bollinger with Premier Guitar. Today we're going to do a quick introduction of the pedal steel guitar. Now, I've always thought of pedal steel as a weird old guy instrument, which admittedly it is. However, it's a relatively new instrument. This basic design has only existed since the 1950s. Um, it started, strangely enough, in Hawaii, where vaqueros that were working cattle and sailors both brought over Spanish guitars. And the local uh, Hawaiians embraced the guitar, but rather than going with a standard tuning, they came up with their own open tunings. And here's where it gets weird. Rather than playing them traditionally, they put them across their lap and began using bars, glass or whatever, to change chords. And there was a player called Joseph Kakuka, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. He immigrated to the mainland and there he became a vaudeville sensation and toured Europe and is single-handedly responsible for this whole Hawaiian music craze. It was a real thing. Um, then in 1932, the Ro Pat Incorporated Company, which later became Rickenbacker, they invented the frying pan, which is the first lap steel, electric lap steel. And then it was on. It became a really popular instrument. Carol Kay, the famous bass player from uh, the Wrecking Crew, she got her start because a door-to-door -door lap steel salesman sold her a lap steel and a lesson book and started her career. And I think G. Smith in his rig rundown, he might have talked about that too. Anyway, lap seals were a real deal. They were everywhere. Now lap seals are very limited because you've got your open tuning and that's all you got. Now you can do things like slide, like bend your bar to, you know, to, to get different chords, but it's, it's limited and difficult. So players were trying to tweak their guitars to get more sonic options. Almost like the way Van Halen had to alter his Frankenstrat to get the sounds that were in his head, Steel players are doing the same thing. Um, there are a few companies trying it, like Gibson had their Electra Harp in 1940, which had a few uh, pedals on the back leg, but it was kind of a disaster. It didn't work very well. Then uh, in 1948, Paul Bigsby began tweaking with them for different players. If you watch the Tom Breshrig rundown, he talks a lot about Bigsby, who was a, a motorcycle mechanic and a machinist and could make anything. And so he began making those and uh, just, you know, for one-offs for a few people. But other people, like um, a player named uh, Bud Isaacs, he put two pedals in front of his guitar and it gave you the first ability to change, like... With that, he recorded a song called Slowly for Webb Pierce, which became a huge hit. And after that, Every steel player that was working needed to be able to emulate that sound. So the race was on. Uh, a little while later, a great steel player named Zane Beck, he added some knee levers to his steel. Um, so between the pedals and the knee levers, that is where we are today. In 1957, uh, Buddy Emmons and Shot Jackson started Show Bud guitars here in Nashville. And if you were ever in Nashville on Lower Broadway listening to music, there's a bar called Roberts on Lower Broadway, a few doors down from Tootsie's. That was the original Showbud factory. So all those guitars were made right there in what is now kind of a famous honky tonk. So there's kind of a beautiful symmetry to all that. So that's when the basic design was happening in the 50s. You know, later 50s was pretty much like this. So this is an E9 pedal steel. Generally, that's a good place to start, particularly for guitar players, because you got your open E, which is a good reference for us. But the E9 itself takes a little getting used to. The tuning seems, when I started, it just seemed arbitrary. It didn't make any sense. But what it is, right there it starts with a, with a B, which is your five, D flat seven, your one, your tonic, your E, F sharp for your two, A flat for your three, B for your five, back to your one, E, A flat, here's where it gets really weird, an E flat, which is a major seven, and a two. 
So it's so weird to have a major seven and a flat seven in the same tuning. So it's a little bit of a learning curve, but you add, traditionally, they usually have three pedals. This guitar is a show pro made by my buddy Jeff Surratt, who's a great steel player. And uh, he he came up with this this guitar, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot like a show, but only made way better. But this one has uh, four pedals and five knee levers. And usually they have between three pedals and four knee levers, or around there. But whereas the pedals will raise strings, the knee levers can raise and lower. But it's pretty complex getting the hang of it because you're, you're working your knees, working your pedals, and then You've got to work your volume pedal, because that's where all that kind of nuance and subtlety comes from. And then you have to block every string, because the because that weird E9 tuning, if you leave it open and ringing, it's cacophonous. So you're blocking with your palm or your picks, barring here, and working your knees, and both both your knees and both your feet. It's, it's a wild ride. Now, some guitars, you'll see a lot of double neck, um, pedal seals, and that's usually a, a E9 here and a C6 here. Um, uh, the C6 gives you a lot lower notes, but to me, if they're, they're big and cumbersome, and the truth is you can play your way out of a gig with a C6, because all that jazzy stuff doesn't really fly in a lot of what you're doing. However, and you can get all that cool kind of jazzy C6 stuff on an E9. So there's just a ton of options on this guitar. Now, although I'm using E9 tuning, there are players like Daniel Lenoir, if you watch his rig rundown, on his old show bud, I don't even, I don't know what that tuning is. I'm not even sure he knows what that tuning is. I think he just changes it for the song to get this weird ambient, ethereal weirdness. Uh, and then guys like uh, Robert Randolph, uh, Check out his rig rundown. He comes from the sacred, he plays a 12 string, um, which gives you a little more bottom end, and his tuning is just whatever he comes up with. I don't know what, what it is, but he's just a really creative guy. Now, interesting enough, interestingly enough, you know, he came out, out of the sacred steel tradition, which were these great black churches where players were, were incorporating steel and getting almost like this kind of kind of, I don't know. When you hear, it's almost like a singing quality. You know, if you hear uh, Robert Randolph, sometimes he does sound like Derek Trucks, you know, that kind of singing great, great playing. Or, and sometimes he sounds like Hendrix. When, when the Sacred Steel thing first hit Nashville, I remember hearing a lot of traditional steel players saying, well, that's not even steel. But when Bud Isaac came out with his first pedal steel, you know, on, on slowly, there were steel players back then, lap steel players are, that were objecting, like that's not even steel. So it's all about, I don't know, the evolution of music. It's, it's, it's pretty beautiful. Now, uh, cool things that, that, that Robert Randolph does, he gets that real dirty thing. <laughs> He also does, he does weird, weird stuff with like envelope filters and things like that. And I don't know, I mean, I can't even, I, I can't emulate it, but, but he does these crazy, let me try and get like some of this, like. Yeah. 
you know, weird, he gets weird, crazy tones like that. So there are, uh, there are a ton of players doing really interesting things today on them. So this is just an introduction, but I encourage you to explore the pedal steel. Unlimited options on there. So y'all play on.